Corals make the largest living structures on the planet, building reefs that cover hundreds of miles and can be seen from space. But did you know that these massive reefs all started from a single teeny tiny baby the size of a grain of sand? And that tiny baby was the result of corals having sex? It's a little different from what you're probably picturing. In this video, we're going to take a deep dive into the fascinating ways that corals reproduce and why this process is key to the persistence of reef ecosystems. If you're enjoying these videos and want to support us to make more, check out our gear at waterlust.com. We make environmentally responsible apparel for ocean lovers that helps us fund marine science research and education, including coral printed swimwear made from recycled materials and coral species t-shirts made from organic cotton and printed with algae ink. Your purchase helps keep our small business afloat and allows us to make more videos. Thank you so much for the support. If you aren't familiar with the basic biology of what a coral is, now is a great time to check out our other video, What Are Corals, for some background information. In it, you'll learn what corals are and why they're vitally important to the health and well-being of our planet. Sexual reproduction is one of the most fundamental biological processes. None of us would be here without it. Generally speaking, organisms reproduce to ensure the continuation of their species, increase their population size, and promote genetic diversity. Whether it's the courtship rituals of birds, the mating dances of insects, or the complex behaviors of humans, sexual reproduction is a complex and diverse phenomenon that plays a critical role in shaping the natural world. Among all the wild and wacky ways to reproduce that the animal kingdom has come up with, corals have one of the most fascinating. There are two ways corals create more corals. The first is called asexual reproduction. Because coral colonies are made up of many small units called polyps, they can break into multiple fragments and keep surviving. Each fragment continues to grow and add new polyps. Asexual reproduction is extremely effective for making lots of coral tissue relatively quickly, which makes this strategy very useful for reef restoration. Scientists have harnessed asexual reproduction to fragment and grow thousands of coral colonies, which have been planted on degraded reefs to replace colonies that have died. Throughout Florida and the Caribbean, Elkhorn and Staghorn corals have been brought back from the brink of extinction thanks to fragmentation and the hard work of dedicated restoration scientists. To learn more about how coral fragmentation is being used to restore coral reefs, check out our How Does Coral Restoration Work video. Although fragmentation is a great tool for creating lots of corals and rapidly restoring reef habitat, each fragment that breaks off from a colony is essentially a clone with the same genetic makeup as that original colony. In nature, having a whole bunch of the same thing is not necessarily good. Healthy populations of all living things, including humans, need genetic diversity or individuals with many different traits in order to persist when conditions change. For example, when a new disease outbreak sweeps through a reef, it could easily kill all the corals if they all have the same or similar genetic makeup. However, if there's a lot of variation between the corals, that disease can only target some but not others, as those with different traits will survive. Thus, if a population is to live beyond the first disease outbreak that comes its way, fragmentation can't be their only reproductive strategy. So how do new, genetically unique corals come into being? The same way humans and all other animals do. Sex! Sexual reproduction involves the exchange and recombination of genetic material between individuals, resulting in offspring with unique combinations of genes, which may help them survive in different environments. This process is essential for the evolution of species, as it creates genetic diversity that allows populations to adapt over time. Technically speaking, sexual reproduction requires the fusion of gametes, eggs and sperm, from two different parents to produce a new, unique individual genetically distinct from both the parents. Some coral species are gonochoric, meaning that, like humans, they produce either eggs or sperm, but not both. In contrast, most coral species are neither male nor female. They are hermaphrodites, which means that a single colony, or even a single polyp, produces both eggs and sperm. Whether you're a gonochore or a hermaphrodite, the genetic material you produce needs to meet that of another, genetically unique individual for reproduction to occur. Just like in humans and all other organisms, eggs and sperm need to meet in order to fertilize and create offspring. But unlike humans, corals are stuck in place, so they need to release their eggs and sperm into the water for fertilization. 
But if a coral releases its gametes when no other corals are releasing theirs, they won't get fertilized. To successfully produce lots of diverse offspring, all the corals on a reef need to release their gametes all at once, a process called broadcast spawning. How do animals that can't move, see, or speak figure out when to spawn? They use cues from the environment around them. Most corals spawn during the warmest months of the year. Here in Florida, this usually means August and September. The rising water temperatures through the spring and early summer trigger gametogenesis, when corals produce eggs and or sperm and get them ready for spawning. To pinpoint the specific day to spawn, corals use photoreceptors to detect moonlight. Most corals spawn a few days after the full moon, when the light they detect begins to wane in intensity. They also use these photoreceptors to determine the time of day. Most typically spawn during or up to a few hours after sunset. Finally, when the time has come, corals send chemical messages to one another through the water to signal that it's go time. Suddenly, the reefscape turns into a snow globe as millions of gametes are expelled into the water column. For the gonochoric species, male colonies release sperm into the water and female colonies release eggs. These meet and make offspring, pretty standard from a human point of view. In hermaphrodites, when it's time to spawn, the eggs and sperm in each polyp are packaged together into a single gamete bundle, which looks like strawberry Dippin' Dots ice cream. These bundles are positively buoyant because they're packed with lipids or fats, which will help nourish the resulting offspring. Upon release, these gamete bundles slowly float to the surface of the water. In some places with a large concentration of corals, like the Great Barrier Reef, so many colonies spawn at once that their gametes form a visible slick on the surface. This is actually an evolved strategy. Scientists believe that corals evolved to spawn en masse in order to overwhelm predators, making it impossible for them to eat all the gametes from a given individual and thus maximizing the reproductive success of the corals. At the surface, gamete bundles break apart into their individual egg and sperm cells, and eggs are fertilized by sperm from other colonies. The newly formed coral embryos begin cell division, going from one cell to two to four, and so on. By the end of the night, the single-celled embryos have turned into multicellular organisms, the foundation of tomorrow's reef. The newly formed coral larvae drift with the ocean currents for several days or even weeks, sometimes traveling far from their birthplace. At this stage, they don't yet host algal symbionts or even have tentacles to feed with, so they rely on the fat reserves from their yolk sac. Soon the larvae begin swimming on their own, using tiny hairs or cilia along their bodies to move down to the ocean floor. The larvae are now searching for a suitable place to make their permanent homes. They use chemical cues to choose optimal habitat by sensing the presence of important reef species like other corals and algae. After some exploration, the larvae attach themselves to the bottom and begin metamorphosis. A mouth begins to form, followed by tentacles, which enable food capture. No yolk needed anymore. By feeding, the baby coral also ingests algal symbionts, which are incorporated into their tissues as their first symbiotic partners. Now called a primary polyp, this baby coral begins to look more like an adult. Over the next few months, the baby coral photosynthesizes and eats, growing larger and gathering enough energy to build new polyps. Eventually, it grows into a new colony on the reef. This process can be pretty slow. Though growth varies a lot by species, a one-year-old colony may be no larger than a golf ball, and a five-year-old colony might top out at the size of a basketball. Because they stay small for so long, juvenile corals are vulnerable to predation and competition. Many reef animals might find a little coral to be a tasty snack, and other larger organisms might grow over and smother it. As such, very few baby corals actually make it to adulthood. The lucky ones that survive will grow to sexual maturity after about 5 to 10 years, when they will start to develop gametes of their own and reproduce through spawning. As we rapidly lose coral reef ecosystems due to climate change and other stressors, both types of reproduction, asexual and sexual, are critical for the persistence of coral populations. Asexual propagation is best for creating lots of coral colonies and biomass quickly to replace the habitat that has been lost, and sexual reproduction is best for creating new, genetically distinct individuals that boost population resilience and replace the genetic diversity that's been lost. Scientists have worked hard to harness and assist both types of reproduction in order to restore coral reefs. Although reproduction alone will not be enough to ensure a future for coral reefs, it is a critical component of any restoration effort. 
Ultimately, nothing lives forever. So the ability to make additional members of your species and pass on your genes to the next generation continues to be one of the most fundamental processes for living things. Corals are no exception. So whether the next time you see an enormous coral colony is on a dive or on your favorite nature show, remember that it was originally created during a spectacular mass spawning event. Started out as a teeny tiny swimming larva no bigger than a grain of sand, and took decades, if not centuries, to become the beautiful coral it is today.